Okay. I believe we're live. I'm just checking for us. We are live. Okay. Take it away, folks. Hello. Welcome to All Academy. Um, today we're talking to um, Evelyn, who is the founder of Awesome Training and um, Confident Kids. And we're talking all things kind of boundaries, consent, personal space. Um, we're going to um, probably talk about their book that they've recently published called um, Standing Up For Myself, um, which I'm sure she'll tell you a bit more about in a minute. Um, but if we do a little bit of um, <clears throat> explaining, uh, my words aren't really wording today, this is not brilliant. Um, if we do a um, physical description of ourselves first, and then we'll get started on our kind of questions and our, um, and our conversation as well. So I shall start first. Um, I am a white person with short blonde hair, which is kind of messy as usual. Um, you can see me from kind of the shoulder upwards and I'm wearing a green t-shirt. I have large uh, brown and orange glasses, which are quite round. And um, I've got an eyebrow bar in my left eyebrow, which is blue. And I'm sat on a kind of quite light gray colored sofa in front of Simon's favorite old lady green curtains. <laughs> so Evelyn, I don't know if you want to do a description of yourself and introduce yourself as well. Sure, yeah, I'm Evelyn. Um, I'm, uh, I haven't done this before, so forgive me. <laughs> I'm not used to describing myself. Uh, a middle-aged white woman. <laughs> um, I have kind of blonde hair with little, still remnants of pink. Um, it's tied up in a ponytail. I am wearing um, black framed glasses and I have a black t-shirt, a grey cardigan and a silver necklace with a little three little discs on it and I'm in my office so there's two plants behind me and I have um, two shelves with my books which are really colourful um, and we're going to talk about those later. Okay. okay yeah and Soph? Yeah I'm Soph, I use they him pronouns. I have big chunky black headphones on. I'm white. I have kind of dirty blonde hair that's long on the top and the sides are shaved. I have red glasses with kind of gold edges. Uh, and I'm just wearing a, a chill kind of cream t-shirt with a fun pocket with some like Japanese cherry blossom art on it, which I love. There's like a little trans flag in the corner. Otherwise it's just like room things, cardigans, <laughs> backpacks, etc. And I'm Stops. excited to, to be here to have this conversation with y'all. Perfect. Um, yeah. Um, so if we start with Evelyn, um, um, <laughs> in a very short way, how would you, um, who are you and what are your dedicated interests? In a very short way. <laughs> Summarise, if you would. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I'm Evelyn. I... Uh, Oh, uh, I, you know, well, I, I founded Awesome Training and Confident Kids, uh, which we'll talk about later. I'm also a mom to um, a little girl who, eight-year-old Maddie. Um, I live in Cork, Ireland. And um, since I found out I was autistic eight years ago, I suppose autism has become one of my primary interests, but, you know, which has led on to like tons of other things as well. Um, I also am really passionate about like children's rights and, and I've worked with kids for 20 years. So, um, yeah. And, you know, so I suppose that they're my main interests at the moment. Oh, and feminism now. That's my new thing. Reading <laughs> I'm reading all these like burning woman books. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, actually, yeah, it's my new interest right now. Perfect. And Soph? Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned that you figured out your autistic eight years ago yeah. um can you tell us more like yeah that what discovery was eight years and like what was that like yeah it was um it was it was life-changing um it was I suppose um it has led just to so much self-discovery um working through so much trauma 
Um, you know, I suppose at the time I, you know, if, if, I'm like a, like a different person now, you know, I was masking so much. Um, and it's been very gradual, I think, over the past eight years. I think like the first four years was very gradual and then it was like quite sudden that I just kind of saw everything, but a deconditioning. Um, <laughs> And just kind of realized that, you know, um, yeah, I suppose I'm entitled to be myself in this world like everybody else and let go of the masking. And, you know, I it's wonderful that I just don't really have that fear anymore of what other people think of me. Like it's gone, you know. So like that's been like obviously a huge, massive change in, in my life. Um but um, I, you know, and I always say like my dear, I was autistic was life changing, but like meeting other autistic people, I think was probably like even more so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, we've spoken about it a little bit, but um, you recently published your, um, your, I don't know if it's your, it's your first book. Am I right in saying that? Um, I wrote three three workbooks, the little the connect workbooks, um, uh, two years ago, probably when lockdown came. I was like, "What will I do?" Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, because I had been teaching classes and stuff for so long, and I was like, "What will I do?" So I put some of the stuff we 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 do in our classes into the books. Um, but even now, two years on, I'm like, I need to redo them, revamp them, because obviously I've changed, and I I, I gotta have a different outlook a bit on things as well. Um, so yeah, standing up for myself was kind of. That's like the first kind of three series. And then I, I yeah, this is kind of the, <clears throat> the newest one. Well, actually, no, it's the one I wrote before Christmas. And then since then, we've, we've put um, Include, which is um, mm -hmm. like a neurodiversity program for schools and clubs. So, yeah, we've been busy. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, did you want to tell us a bit more about standing up for myself? Yeah, um, sure. I mean, I have a few slides. Do you want me to put them up or will I just chat? It's Oh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, you can sure. use them if you want to. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, it's more for me because otherwise I could end up talking about anything. <laughs> so they kind of slides keep me um, uh, focused. Uh, yeah, so Standing Up For Myself. So it's a book for autistic kids and teens. Like, I don't really like putting ages on things. Mm -hmm. So, but obviously like a four-year-old probably <laughs> the content isn't probably suitable for a four-year-old is a bit of you know we're talking about boundaries and consent and stuff in a and the language that's used so I kind of start maybe nine plus to 15s um because I, I'm working on one for adults um you know uh, it actually started out as an adult book and then it just got really complex like trying to explain power play and breaking it down but I think that's the best way to I suppose understand something as well is to try and break it down to teach other people um so I wanted so you know I just said look let's make a teen book um which I wanted to do as well and I um yeah so I suppose it it it, it it's about teaching autistic kids and teens um even though I have I know adults are, are using it like I sent it on to some of my friends they're like uh, I learned loads of stuff my husband was like uh, I learned loads of stuff this. but that's the thing because it's stuff that I've learned I suppose over the past you know eight years um as well it's about like a boundary I didn't know what boundaries were you know the fact that I could say I can say no to people I don't have to you know, I, like, at, at, even before I found out I was autistic, I suppose I, I would have gone for, you know, counselling and, you know, talking to my therapist. I remember I was like, I can I can say no. I, I You mean I don't have to please everybody around me? And it was just like, whoa, one of these light bulb moments. Um, you know, and I just don't want um, other autistic people, you know, waiting until they're 30 odd to, you know, to kind yeah. of find that out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, autonomy, self-advocacy, personal space, um consent all of these things are so important and I do I don't think as far as I know that there's some that there is any resource out there for autistic kids and teens around around these and obviously you know our society our you know as adults we're not very good generally at um respecting kids boundaries anyway and asking for consent it's like lots of people think that we shouldn't even do, you know, <laughs> we shouldn't even be doing that. So this book is probably for adults just as much as it is for the mm -hmm. kids, because um, there's no point a kid trying to empower themselves and set boundaries if adults don't respect that. Mm -hmm. um, and then power play, I put a little bit of that into the book because um, it's something that I wish I'd known when I was younger as well about um, just these games people play. I suppose, you know, like that, that's, I think that's like one of the fundamental differences between being autistic or neurodivergent and, and not being is that there's, the, you know, they're kind of playing roles within this social 
um, hierarchy, whereas we're not, and it just doesn't really make sense to us. Like that whole idea of somebody in a relationship being someone's boss, like, you know, we're like, <laughs> um, someone saying like, who's the boss in this relationship? Like, it just blows my mind. Like it just mm. wouldn't, that first of all, that someone wants to be in charge of their partner and then that their partner wants someone to be in charge of them. I just blows my mind. Um, and I suppose there's lots of little things that we do as children that are power play. They are about like who's who's who's, mm. who's top dog in the group, who's who's ranking where. Um, and when you're autistic and that's not how you see the world, it's not how you operate in the world, then it's like it doesn't make any sense to you. And I think we get caught. And you know, if a kid child runs away from you, you know, I used to do that as a kid. I was like, oh, this is a game. I'd run after them. I didn't realize it was like them seeing who had the power in this situation mm -hmm. you know and all, all that kind of stuff so i really wanted to like break that down for kids as well um yeah and i suppose you know talk about what your personal space is and that you're very much entitled to be yourself in this world unapologetically and mm -hmm. um, that we're all born into this world and the space around us is ours and people need our permission to come inside that space it's as simple as that you know and i know people don't i know like in schools, it's quite common for like teachers to confiscate people's things, you know, and it's just like so wrong when you really think of it. I know that's kind of the system I grew up in where that's just what we were used to. But, you know, mm -hmm. my own child is coming home telling me these things now. And I'm like, this is just so wrong. Like you can't just take something because you're older and bigger and, you know, in some sort of, um, you know, role of authority. Like what message is that sending to a child? Like that's mm -hmm. just total abuse of power that's how I see it now um yeah so I suppose that's that's what the book is about a little bit about me um as I said I'm autistic since 2014 obviously that's my attempt at a joke because I'm autistic <laughs> all my life <laughs> and uh, but I found out in 2014 and um yeah you know it, it has been life-changing um you know I, I often think like well, what would I be doing now or, or who would I be now what would be going on in my life if I hadn't found out you know because mm. and not just for me but for our family you know like my daughter was one at the time so the way I parent you know mm. my husband's been on his own journey now because of this and just like how we you know it's, it's it's just been massive like um and I as I said I worked with kids for like 20 years as a speech and drama teacher and um like literally confident kids was my you know we drama classes and my approach was always like to teach kids kind of using drama as a tool rather than like the end performance so that um, to use it as, you know, to give kids an opportunity to feel good about themselves, to build their confidence. Obviously, we just attract loads of neurodivergent kids anyway, whether they know it or not, because it's, you know, it's drama, it's creative. Um, and the middle, I literally, literally <laughs> I was like, I'm autistic, right, okay, well, what can I do? And I wanted to set up a class where we could use drama to teach kids about communication. And I suppose that, that's, that's how I saw it at the time. I didn't even know the words social skills existed. Um, and then I you know, was reading all this stuff and I was like, oh, autism and social skills. And I was like, well, if I call this course a social skills course, then that's what people are going to be looking for. Um, um, so that's kind of what I called it. And, you know, and I'm the first to admit that eight years ago, I thought I had problems with social skills, you know, because that's what you're told. It's like, mm. oh, you know, and even the questions they ask you, it's like, you know, do you have difficulty in relationships and like, you know, not keeping relationships? And I was like, yes. Oh, yeah. Like all those failed relationships, they're all my fault. Like, you know, that's what mm. I was doing until I actually popped on and, you know, I suppose read what other autistics were writing and Damien Milton's theory and all that kind of stuff. And I was just like, Oh yeah, hi. Like, why am I blaming myself for everything when it's a two-way thing? Communication, friendships, all that stuff is two-way, and everybody, well, the two people have a part to play in it. You can't blame yourself for everything, but when you've spent your lifetime blaming yourself for everything, you know it was quite normal to just start mm. doing that. So, um, yeah, I mean, what 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 we what it started off as the Connect classes and the Connect program is very different now. It, it was never social skills training as in like the awful, like I didn't even realize that what social skills training was till a couple of years later. Mm. Uh, you know, and I, I went to a three day conference and I was like, oh, I'm, this is not what I'm doing. Like, this is like, you know, um, 
And uh, it would have come from a very protective place because I suppose, as, as, as we all know, we can be, you know, people telling us they're our friends who aren't our friend. We can be manipulated. You know, when you're masking, you've all these people pleasing behaviors. And it was really trying to create something that would help kids to recognize those things in other people as well and, and, and read situations and just kind of realize not everybody is coming from the same place we are and, and, and all of that. But it has developed into, um, yeah, really, I suppose we moved everything online two years ago. So we have kids like from Australia, from the States, from, from Europe, Ireland, UK, um, you know, and it's, it, it's, it's really about giving them a space to hang out with other autistic kids, mm. uh, which is something I saw straight away when I started teaching just autistic kids together. I was like, we don't need to be teaching them anything. Like, literally, we just need to be giving them this space to be mm. themselves. Um, and it is important. And like, obviously, some of the stuff we hear is heartbreaking, um, you know, the way kids are excluded or the way they're being treated, um, all, all of that kind of stuff. So it's about them connecting with each other, um, you know, getting support where they need it. If they do need like even things like asking for help when you're afraid to ask for help or you're afraid you'll feel like stupid in front of other people, that kind of stuff. It's like how you go. But, you know, so. It is teaching them, I suppose, self advocacy skills. So maybe I, maybe, maybe this is the time to change the name <laughs> of what we do. And um, uh, then, like last year, I felt like it was still about the kid. It was like we're still doing something that's trying to support the child and the child only. So what we started doing then is we've we've added in like weekly education for the parents now. So it's really trying to change the environment because that's what obviously needs to happen and we've uh, you know we give them resources that they can share with schools and family and friends because um you know an autistic kid can't do all the work can't do everything mm -hmm. i mean yeah we communicate differently to maybe the norm majority but uh, we have to meet each other at halfway because obviously mm -hmm. us doing all the work doesn't work for us we know that and um yeah so i mean that's that's kind of what we're doing at confident kids um, and then I set up Awesome Training. Um, it was just a Facebook page originally, like Awesome Cork, I called it, just because I was finding out so much stuff. And I felt like, oh, everybody needs to know this. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And in my innocence, I thought, I'll just tell everybody all this stuff. They'll be, you know, as happy as I am to know that <laughs> this abuse, <laughs> that we shouldn't be doing it. And, um, you know, uh, no, obviously that didn't happen. So it, it's been a tough journey, but... Um, I, you know, it's it's kind of developed naturally because three years ago, um, you know, we were just I was in a group and it was just chatting about like another conference that was going to be on in Ireland and who was going to be talking at it and what they were going to be saying about us. And you know, I just said, oh, look, I'm just going to organize our own one. Um, and I did. Um, and it was our first like autistic led conference here. Um, I actually don't think there's been any since. We were obviously due to have one the following year, but COVID stopped it. So we did it online. Um, but yeah, it, it just kind of started all from there then. And um, yeah, I suppose I was training people, you know, kind of doing courses on Saturdays where I was teaching people about kind of my approach to social skills. But like people didn't know autism. They didn't like literally, I was like, mm. so what I started out to do became actually kind of explaining the basics to people um, really. And I suppose, yeah, it's just developed. And obviously because of COVID, we, We've kind of been thrown into all the online training and writing books, but it's been good. Like, so it hasn't been, um, yeah, it hasn't been all negative. Um, I suppose I just wanted to say like why I wrote the book as well. Um, it is to empower kids and teens because um, everything else that's out there is really about like teaching autistic kids to please other people. Um, <laughs> I wanted to offer them an alternative to the negative narrative. So, you know, even the way we define autism, the way we look at ourselves, you know, uh, you know, we, so I just wanted to give them a different, I suppose, a different outlook um, and how we can look at, you know, sensitivity. Yes, it can be painful at times, but it also means that we can, you know, be really connected to the world around us and that kind of stuff. And if people actually understood that we are just really sensitive to things, then and and, and accommodated that, then our lives could be different. And you know, it's it's not it doesn't have that we don't have to be living the way we are, I suppose. And um, uh, I think it's important to give kids that outlook instead. You know, um, 
or you know as well and let them choose um uh yeah and i really wanted something to empower them to kids to to and teens to to just be themselves and and not having not, not having to apologize for it um and to create something alternative for therapists because i know we're kind of in this phase where you know some therapists realize like autistic kids don't need social skills training mm-hmm. but they're still looking for but what we use instead because mm-hmm. you know, it's like but uh, nothing <laughs> like but and i just feel that but also autistic kids do not that they need therapy but they do need support to be themselves because there's so much um negativity i think coming at them so mm-hmm. Um, you know, I suppose, and it, it's just about making resources that are um, accessible to people, to parents um, and, and schools, you know, as well. Um, and yeah, I did a talk with the Neurodiversity Therapist Collective yesterday. So I'm really excited that it's like the first book that they're actually recommending for their therapists to use as an alternative to social skills. So that's pretty cool. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's based obviously on a lot of stuff I learned. I mean, and things that I just wanted to share with others. Um, but it's also based on like the collective experiences of, of our community. Um, and a lot of, you know, obviously, you know, I'm older than the kids we have in our program at the moment, but, um, you know, a lot of the stories are the same, unfortunately. Things aren't mm. changing, even with all of our, um, you know, pro neurodiversity and all the symbols and all the things people are using. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be changing. Mm. Um, are changing fast enough so um that's kind of all i have in slides um well i did have another one in boundaries but i think i will just chat about that so i'll be yeah so i'll yeah. stop it <laughs> okay. <the> <laughs> so so how would you um dis- describe and kind of do a summary of what boundaries actually are uh, yeah um i suppose i i think of boundaries as like um i think having that understanding of personal space and that you have this kind of, it is quite physical. And and I think we all know what it feels like to have someone come into that space. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's first of all, I suppose that, 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 that physical space around you. Um, and I think it, it, it's about, um, you know, how you manage your, or how you respect your own, your own time, your own energy, um, you know, your autonomy, um, because I don't think we live in a world where, you know, <laughs> where it's like, this is, this is, this is, you know, you have a right to all of these things. It, I suppose it is very much about your, your space and your, and your right. Um, I'm trying to think of a better explanation right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that's how I start in the book. It's, it's talking about like that personal physical space about around you and then everything within that, which is your thoughts. You know, you don't have to answer people. You don't have to share things mm. with people unless you're comfortable doing it. Um, you know, your feelings, they're yours. They belong to you. They're, you know, they're, you know, what they are, their response to the people, obviously your belongings, but things like your time, your body, all of these things are, you know, yours. Um, and like what having a healthy boundary looks like and having a healthy friendship looks like. And Like, I think it's important to say as well that like, like I know I worked backwards. It was like, you know, as I said, you know, before I found out I was autistic, I was working with therapists and, you know, it was like working on my boundaries. And it was like this very deliberate thing, you know, feeling really uncomfortable about like saying no to things, like literally just trying to, but you know, it got easier as as you start doing it. But what I found personally, and I suppose it's quite common that like the more we reconnect with ourselves, the less we mask, the more like self-worth we have, the more comfortable we are in our own space. Um, You know, the more that those boundaries come naturally. And I think that's why we have difficulty with boundaries is because actually we just aren't allowed to use them. You know what I mean? It's like, we're not actually from a young age, they're not respected. I mean, you shouldn't be allowing anybody. That's even the wrong word. You know what I mean? Like it's not up to someone else to kind of give the personal space to it. It belongs to start. Mm. I also have an idea that our boundaries are different. Like I, I do think that because we're so connected to the world and because uh, we're so empathetic that we don't like our boundaries aren't, you know, like professional friendship. We don't have those kind of, you know, 
I, I do think we have different boundaries. Yeah, and I think that's different for, um, well, for young people, but also adults who, so a lot of them, so I run, uh, just in case you don't know this, Evelyn or anyone who's watching, I run um, social groups for disabled children and I'm, I coach wheelchair basketball as well. Um, so a lot of the kids that I work with are physically disabled and, you know, and we're working with teenagers and adults as well. And, uh, you know, if you're, um, they use the word toileting in professional, in professional spaces, but I'm not huge on that. But if you're doing like personal care and stuff, like it, it's a really difficult thing for everyone involved because when you, um, you know, depend on people to help you with your personal care, like the personal boundaries become, I think, especially if you're learning disabled as well or with mental health issues or whatever else, I think like the boundaries become very, very blurred very, very quickly. Um, and I know a lot of the young people that I work with, I would say was quite vulnerable to kind of, um, you know, if there was, I mean, none of our volunteers do personal care, but if there was a new volunteer at work, um, you know, they'd be like, well, you're, you're here and I need to go to the toilet. So they would kind of go on their merry way. So, um, so yeah, really, really important for that, for that group of people as well. Yeah. Uh, but an even blurrier line there I think um so how so it's it's how do we set especially with power imbalances like that um or for definitely for young people or for non-speaking people like how are those boundaries set oh you see and so I think as well even though we talk about our personal boundaries so much of that is dependent on the people around us mm. um and I really think it comes down to how they respect, like you can help someone, you can, um, I, I, I suppose it comes in, you know, where, yeah, if someone is caring for you or helping you, that you still ask permission to enter that person's space. Mm. You know, I mean, that person probably doesn't have a choice whether they say yes or no, because, you know, they probably need you to help them. But I think it is about like, asking someone's permission you know anytime that you're you're coming into someone's space to, to do whatever mm. um uh and I suppose it, it it's about yeah it's about how we communicate that and I just find that people don't often recognize particularly if someone is non-speaking um you know they don't respect their communication they don't actually or, or, or even understand that like this is a kid um you know asserting their boundaries this is a kid saying no um and look at how that's misinterpreted and and, and, and you know mm. like seen as bad behavior challenging behavior all these kind mm. of things instead of actually going that is somebody asserting themselves mm. you know and um you know i've seen that kind of stuff happen um you know where a non-speaking kid said no you know, with his hand before at a, at a kind of kids thing I was I was at, um, and you know there was <clears throat> someone who had been working in a special school. You know, kind of took his hands, not not violently or anything like that, but you know, took his hands and was like quiet hands. And I was just like, oh my god, like that child is saying no. He's not going to say it to you. This is his way of saying no. And like, if that's not respected, um, yeah, you know. And I just thought like he was saying no he didn't want to do the thing you wanted him to do you know mm -hmm. and it's just like so I just think there's so much kind of um that's such a big question but I do think it is it starts with other people like mm -hmm. you can't assert yourself like you, 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 you just can't I mean if you're if mm -hmm. people are abusing you and people aren't respecting you they're like it doesn't matter what you're saying or doing mm -hmm. unless those people see you as a human being first uh, mm -hmm. and equal um you know so um I think that's a very important part of it um mm. other people you know yeah absolutely and I think I see that a lot um because I do nursery work as well and I see that a lot it seems to be like the the younger you go down um professionally speaking of the uh, young people that you support it seems to be more um the power is with the adults as opposed to the children and I think like I'm all for set routines I'm autistic I love a set routine they're brilliant but I'm I'm also not going to like not physically drag a child but if if a child isn't interested in doing something then it's not a problem like it's not illegal like 
if they're not joining in with song and rhyme time in in the grand scheme of things does it really matter that they're playing with trucks instead of joining in with song and rhyme time and i i find that i i kind of butt heads with people in uh, i i mean i talked about early years but in youth work as well like you know we, we've kind of got the day set up like this and a cookery is like my biggest nightmare with the kids i work with um so like you know if we kind of get 10 lasagnas at the end of this kind of and there's not a big brawl in the middle of the kitchen like and everyone's happy and safe like then i don't really mind really um I, I, yeah, I find people are very restrictive in the way that they think that things have to be done in a certain way, which is really strange coming from someone who's supposed to be like rigid and repetitive. Yeah. But like, okay. yeah, and I, I just think, what, what, what is the power play here? There's some serious, serious issues with some adults working with young people. That are just like, you need to do what I say when I say it, and when I say jump, you say how high. And I just, it's just, it's, it's quite frightening, really. Mm. It, it is frightening it's frightening how normal it is mm. like how accepted it is um you know um and you know I mean it, it's even how people view education like teaching the kid to make the lasagna or to do the thing it's like that's not what it's about it's about the process it's about you know like kids spending time learning and you know also this you know making mistakes that you know making children feel bad about making mistakes like that's part of learning. That's how we know stuff. That's literally mm. like how yeah. we, you know, experiment and, and do things. But yeah, it's very, like, I just find, yeah, we're supposed to be rigid, but actually, no, I mean, the systems are incredibly rigid. And like, mm. I mean, if you actually kind of stand back and look at our education system, you know, and it's pretty similar in the UK to Ireland, you know, it's not about education. It's about compliance. Mm. Like, it is about compliance. Um, you know, and I, I like, I, I kind of use the example sometimes of my nursery school teacher, preschool teacher um you know I didn't sit in the circle um I don't re I don't remember it my mom used to tell us tell me but you know I, I sat somewhere else you know for story time but she that was she was totally fine with it I mean, you know it's like why like imagine if she tried to pull me into the circle and sit with the other kids and you know for what for what and this is the thing it's like if, if for compliance because it's the only reason why someone would try to pull you in and also, I suppose, though, to defend people, they, we do have this idea that if someone's not in the circle, that they're not included. But that's, you know, something we put into the include book. It's like being included looks different for different people. Mm, yeah, I can be included better if I'm sitting over there on my own. Um, but yeah, it's just like this. And and, and it's not all, you know, it, it's it's also like the, the kind of coercion and the bribing and, mm. um, you know, making kids feel bad if they're not doing something and I mean just that idea that like kids are doing things deliberately to annoy you like some adults have that kind of idea like it's like no, that kid is just you know or the kid who forgets like giving out to someone for forgetting something it's like like it's not a purposeful you know don't set out to forget something you know and I'm sure you feel bad enough if you forget it it's just really not it, it, it yeah I think we have like I suppose it is all the behaviorism just like you, you know decades of behaviorism being used and people think that that's normal and it's okay and we left corporal punishment you know um behind it's like well well you know that generation grew up we're like well we can't do this to kids now but oh what will we do instead it's like, again yeah <laughs> nothing <laughs> yeah you don't need to mm. have you know, to be molding children into being things that they're not, just let give them space to be themselves. Mm -hmm. um, like I had, a, I had a really wonderful experience during the week. I, there's um, there's two Sudbury schools in Ireland. I don't know how familiar people are with that, but it's like a, a very different model of, of schooling. Um, like it's all ages together. So there was like five-year-old to kind of teenagers and kids like literally, it's very democratic. So like everybody gets to decide like what they do. Uh, yeah to me yeah <laughs> yeah sounds them. really cool yeah I'd heard of them but I'd never actually like been in one so I went down to like talk to kids about neurodiversity or whatever and it was like they had had to have a vote or well they do a, their own kind of decision making thing but you know first of all it, it, like they all decided that I was coming it wasn't like just the adults and then they didn't have to be in the space with me or they could have just come in listened to you know some you know didn't want to hear anything I'd say that and I, it was so lovely because I had no expectations. I didn't feel like I had to perform. I didn't feel under pressure. 
So, you know, if they got fed up halfway through, they went off doing something else and there was a facilitator who went off doing the other thing. I was like, this is just so amazing. <laughs> like, mm. this is, you know, it's just having choices because mm. they have like different options and different, like, so you can do this, you know, if you want, if you, you know, are we doing this at the moment or whatever. It's just, it's just such a, such a different model. And it's like, what I think would really work for all children, but, you know, particularly mm-hmm. neurodivergent kids. So like they have options about, you know, what they can learn about. I mean, we're interested, you know, it's very hard to learn about something we're not interested in, like almost mm-hmm. impossible for many of us. So uh, <laughs> why put someone through that? Or, you know, someone who finds maths really hard, what, why, you know, what, why put them through that for what, you know, for what? And, I just find like I do a lot of training with, with with schools and teachers and and teacher assistants and SNAs and you know it's always the, the same problem is you know oh, we don't have time like we don't have time to give the children because we have to follow a curriculum and you're like but well, change the curriculum you know like that what's you know we're put you know it's imposing all of these rigid things on people and it's, and children for, for no net, no need like sure they're just the standards that we're creating for ourselves we can change them we can change the mm-hmm. goalposts you know it, it makes no sense and yeah I just think and, and the amount of time given towards rewards and, and bribes and coercing children in schools like what if we just worked uh you know how much time does that take off so mm-hmm. um yeah it, it would be amazing to see I think more alternative models um you know coming um into play i know we only have two of them in ireland so far um but yeah it's 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 fantastic like and it's just yeah just to see it in action like how it actually works um was mm-hmm. fab yeah, it was brilliant yeah oh, okay good i'm just gonna um if you don't mind we've got a few questions yeah. it looks a little bit different to the way we usually do it and i'm not very tech minded so give me a second uh but i think we've got some questions from people who are watching us live um oh simon had a question i've lost it now oh they were talking about cats not having any boundaries <laughs> talking about Zoff's cat um she has no boundaries no except <laughs> for her own which are very very solid yeah very specific yeah um yeah someone was talking about i think victoria was saying about um, also understanding your needs, your sensory profile. If you're not connected with yourself, it's difficult to then understand boundaries and put your boundaries in place, which I think is a very, very, very good point. I think I don't know about, um, because I know all three of us here were, were late diagnosed people. So, you know, like I didn't even understand until about four years ago that I had a sensory profile, yeah. <laughs> that I have sensory differences that, you know, um so just this morning um as a bit of an example like when I went to the, so we have we have D on Friday and we do that round our house and last night it ended up later than it usually does so we didn't put any of the stuff away which last night felt like a good idea then I came down this morning and the kitchen looks different right and it's all like minifigures and this and that and just took um and I had to say to my husband I'm visually very overstimulated right now Whereas I think like four or five years ago, I would have felt the same feeling, but not known what it was at all. Um, so, I, I, yeah, sensory profiles, I think, are very, are very important stuff. I don't know if anyone's got anything you want to add to that. Um, yeah, no, I, I put that I put it into section two, like literally explaining my sensitivities, because like that I wouldn't have known and particularly around food people just think oh you're just being fussy or whatever and I'm like look I can't eat it I'm going to get sick if I eat that like and I know by looking at it if it's going to make me sick and Mm. just even you know things like yeah so I mean it is giving just so that kids can explore what they're sensitive to you know uh and yeah like stuff like visual clutter like I would be like that as well and just being able to say um and sounds like people eating, you know, oh. instead of getting annoyed and triggered, you know, I'm just like, it's, I, you know, I know I would say like, oh, to, you know, to my family, like, it, it's not one of me, it's me, I can't tolerate it. If just, some, one of us moves room, whatever, it's fine, you know, and we work around it. Um, but yeah, knowing you're sensitive, what you're sensitive to is so, so important. Um, and also just knowing that it's okay. 
It is okay. Uh, hearing about your pro your education programs reminded me of how I did Montessori in kindergarten. And that was a real blessing because it helped me get into school. And then when my mom was kind of concerned that I wasn't engaging in activities at the same time, the, the educator was really on the ball. Like, no, like Saf is learning, like Saf is doing what they want to do. And like, like they're, they're behaving well, like they're, they're part of the group, even if they're not like listening to the story in the circle, like they're still engaging and they, they are listening while they're doing this other thing. Uh, but I digress. And I also wanted to throw in about the idea of like, as you're an adult in professionalism, I'm a medical librarian uh, and the Medical Library Association, some of the talks we're having this year are about professionalism. And I really think a synonym for that is compliance because it's wearing specific clothing. It's not having certain color hair. It's having white hair, not textured hair, not mm. hair, um, hairstyles that are protective for black people and BIPOC people. And so school like sets you up so that you can see, succeed in that situation. Mm -hmm. But I appreciate your, your bringing up, we should just create new situations where we don't have to do that. Uh, yeah. But I have a question. We have lots of good questions for you. Um, someone was wondering why autistic people are less likely to have good boundaries. Maybe we're set up to fail. Maybe we don't. There's a communication gap. What do you think? Um, I think the way we, because auti like autistic people together, um, I, like it, you know, I, I think we are kind of more open. Like we don't, we don't have those. So it, it, our boundaries, I, I do think our boundaries are, are different. Uh, and obviously because we're so sensitive to the world around us, you know, we have a different connection to everything. And obviously the people around us as well. Um, so it's quite normal for us to be very open, you know, and then obviously if you're communicating with someone who's not like that, they're telling you that you're oversharing, uh, you know, so uh, <laughs> like maybe they're under listening, but, um, you know, uh, <laughs> we, you know, we want to get real. We want to connect, plug into the other person and, and like feel on a very emotional level. So like our boundaries are quite different because that's what we're doing. Whereas other people have this like block, in front of them that and they're afraid I think sometimes for that you know when we want to connect that way they you know it, it, because that's not the way that they have been operating in this world for whatever reasons mm -hmm. um and I, I do think um you know the way like if everyone was autistic I think we would live in a society where everyone shares and helps each other and it's not that's not like romanticizing stuff it's like literally you know I have this overwhelming need for to help someone else in pain mm -hmm. or to do things which you know obviously when you're empathetic or you know when you feel equal to that person it's like it's happening to you you know if you see somebody as the same as you then you you feel you feel it so you want to help them and I think what happens to us is that we go into this world you know where it's not just autistics or neurodivergent people and it's like we get taken advantage of or people you know go like oh thanks for, thanks a million you know like I've helped out the heavy friends like do different things like move house and all that it's like I move house and I'm like here by well you know what's my husband or whatever and, you know it's we are doing the things ourselves and it's hard because then you have to kind of start saying no to people even though you want to help them just mm -hmm. to protect that so I think first like firstly there's that very natural thing of just being that way in the world um, and then maybe being taken advantage of um, and then kind of, you know, you know, kind of like just having to pull back on that to protect yourself. But then there's the people pleasing. And like when you're taught, whether it's through social skills training, ABA or society, uh, you know, teaching you that you have to be this certain thing in order to be accepted and you do all the things and you're, you're still, you know, not fully really accepted. Mm -hmm. um, it, it teaches you that other people are more important than you. So like, how can you possibly have, how can you possibly, you know, think that you're worth, um, worth the same as other people if you're constantly kind of taught in whatever way that other people are more important than you. That's basically what we're teaching kids. Like social skills training, all that stuff is like, think about how the other person thinks about your actions. What would they, mm -hmm. it's like, you're teaching them that the other person is more important than the, how they are. And nobody's teaching other people about like the autistic kid and how like, how do they feel when you do this? Nobody, you know, well, until you know, we've started doing this kind of stuff, but <laughs> um, because it's important, you know, we need to talk, you know, talk about 
how our actions impact other people totally yeah you know i get that everyone needs to understand that but it's you know not about teaching people that like they have to be whatever other people want them to be because obviously the problem with that is we can't be not everybody wants the same thing from us and then you end up with all these different versions of you and you're like who am i you know when you're like 37 going oh okay you know this explains that um so yeah, I can't even remember what this question was at the start, but <laughs> how boundaries is it are different or something? Is it? <laughs> I mean, I think you really answered it. It was originally why are autistic people less likely to have good boundaries? Oh, yeah. I think you nailed it. Mm -hmm. um, it makes me think about gender too. Like, I don't remember who said this. I was having a conversation and someone was like, trans and non-binary people and gender non-conforming people when they're kids, they, they might recognize something's not quite right with, like how they're being treated, maybe how they feel. And they might say, okay, I'm not doing gender good. And so they do their assigned gender really, really hard. And so like hyper-feminine, hyper-masculine, and then something's yes. still off. <laughs> and so like, oh yeah, Dr. Chloe has a great comment too. Also with alexithemia, actually knowing when someone has crossed your boundary, that can be really tough mm. too. Um, there is a question about that as well that could be good to to ask about alexithemia i can ask that if you'd like katie yeah go for it because in my notes it just says alexithemia <laughs> oh i got you okay um <laughs> how do you even work out what your boundaries are particularly if you're alexithemic and maybe explain what that is for those who might not know because i just learned 30 minutes ago okay um so it's it's when you have difficulty reading your your emotions um uh, but I think there's several reasons for that. Um, so, um, I suppose for me, alexithemia, the way I understand it is something that develops and it develops when people have been through lots of trauma. So it's not so much about like, how do I recognize? So I would rephrase it and be, you know, rather than saying, how do I recognize, you know, when I would actually try and find the root of that trauma and, and work with that because, um, that's the kind of stuff trauma does to us as well. Um, we don't think, you know, you know, or feel that we're worth, um, you know, that we, we basically think, I mean, that's what, you know, if you've been traumatized, people have trampled on your boundaries, people have trampled on you, your spirit, your sense of self. So it's really hard to kind of feel that you're worth it. Um, so um, I, yeah, I suppose it, it's, it's, um, I'm just reading Chloe's notes. Um, uh, it would be more about like where that started. I, also, though, it is possible to kind of, I suppose, uh, tap. You know, if if it if you can't know, or if you you know if you're not sure. I mean, I used to do that before. Like, I'd be like, if the person does this, then I'll know for sure. That's so that that's kind of how I did it. Whereas now I would just know, um, because I suppose I, I've worked on a lot of stuff. But like I would, it would be kind of like I think this person is 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 you know crossing my boundaries. But I'd have a thing that like I'll definitely know like if they do this or if this happens. Um, so I think that that's probably a way to do it. Obviously, that's going to be personal for everybody. But um, having some a kind of check in place, you know. But I mean. Yeah, it, it is hard. I'm just reading to always know difficulty in identifying and describing feelings and in distinguishing feelings from body sensations sensations. Uh, oh, that's the definition. <laughs> difficulty in identifying and describing feelings and in distinguishing feelings from bodily sensations of emotional arousal. Um, yeah, I mean that's 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 how I, I would see it. And then also I think like that we can communicate our feelings in different ways as well. So like we don't all have the same language to describe how we're feeling. So mm. we had, you know, so that's part of it too. Um, but yeah, I think putting some checks in place for yourself, you know, because obviously working on through the trauma is going to take some time. That's like a long-term goal, but the short term is is yeah. Um I don't know. Does anyone else do you have any other that's kind of what I used to do. I'd be like, I get this sense that someone was doing something. And then um yeah, I would have a yeah, kind of a check in place, but that might be not what everyone else does. Chloe's saying that stims are a good indicator if someone knows your stim language. Oh, like for communicating it. Is that, is that what you mean, Chloe? Mm -hmm. And maybe 
I'm going to speak for Dr. Chloe without actually knowing, but Dr. Chloe, feel free to speak if you want. But maybe it has to do with like when a boundary is being crossed, maybe you're stimming in a way that you you can tell that's associated with an anxious feeling or an uncomfortable feeling. And that could be a sign, even if you you might not necessarily be able to say immediately, like, oh, this is a boundary that's crossed and I I need to do something about it or I, I don't feel good about this. Yeah, sure. And it's something other people could read too, if you you know, can't verbalize or whatever or express it differently. Yeah. And I think not not necessarily in a, a lexithemic people, but in general, certainly from my personal experience anyways, as an autistic person and, and neurodivergent for different various different reasons as well, is it's actually it has in the past been really difficult for me to understand and appreciate and therefore stick to other people's boundaries. Um so I think that's something I've definitely had to learn. And like I look back at things and I I just have a bit of cringe really, if I'm honest. Um and I don't know if that's because um you know you have a certain narrative about um social interactions and stuff. Um, and it, it, it should go that way. Like, this is the script. I say this, and then they say this, and then this happens. Um, and then perhaps people don't stick to script, but you're still sticking to the script in your head. I hope that makes sense to somebody outside of my own brain. Like, I'm expecting step A, B, and then C will happen. And then I went A, they went 25 and then yeah. C happened anyways like so um I feel like sometimes it's not it, it, well it's not just about the boundaries we put in place for ourselves but obviously what you were saying earlier about people um that your boundaries and your personal space and and consent and stuff like that are only really as good as people around you respecting them and understanding them um and it makes me think on, on a kind of um, perhaps smaller level, maybe, like some of the kids that I work with, they, and, and me as well. And I, re I read a tweet earlier that it's got something to do with this as well. And it was something to do with um, the clicking of a pen is only annoying if you're not the person clicking the pen. Yeah. So, so with kids at work, um, you know, someone can be very very loud and I'm very very loud but I can deal with my loud noise because I'm in charge of that I'm the person doing that um I know when it's going to come it's not a surprise to me but I can't deal with that from other people and yeah. I think that's very difficult for other people to understand especially if they're not neurodivergent themselves so it almost seems like a double standards of of um you know I need to be able to make noises and able to process or you know for stimming or various other reasons that you might make a lot of noise um noise and i'm also hyperverbal most of the time as well so um but then can't really deal with that from other people and i think a lot of people find that really really difficult um yeah so i think that's a that's another like added layer of um you know trying to set boundaries and and, and be true to other people's as well when actually we've got i don't think it 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 excuses people um, from not respecting other people's boundaries, but I think that our needs as disabled people and just actually probably just people in general, actually, like our needs don't always fit in well with it, other people's. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't know where I was going with that, but I think that's another difficulty. Yeah, I think so. I'm laughing because I'm like, I like process everything by talking so I can have like this. But then if someone else is just like talking and I don't know why they're saying it or it's like too much, I'm like, wait, like I didn't see that. Yeah, yeah, but I get it. Good way, but, you know, I mean, talk about like having to, you know, stim or make loud noises or do whatever you need to do to process it and whatever, live in the world, you know, and, and that it doesn't annoy you and it can annoy other people. But I mean, like that, that's other sensory stuff. Like, I mean, people don't mind their own smell you know but other people might like not like it so it's kind of like I suppose it's, it's, it's just that's 
it, it, it's just I suppose try, this is the thing I think people are always looking for like fixed solutions um you know kind of like how do we do this I was like but it's fluid like our boundaries are also not fixed you know mm-hmm. what I mean they're fluid depending on you how you feel who the people you're with all that kind of stuff um and it is just kind of like a constant thing that like we have are it's coexisting like mm. you know there's no formula I don't well I mean you know I don't know if we have the perfect formula yet or have lost maybe we had it in the past mm. lost it, how we all coexist as human beings but like yeah I mean it's also I suppose there is that kind of like yes everyone's boundaries are important but like you know you know like let's take a parent and a child yeah I can have my boundaries and be like I need these things but if my child needs something my boundaries don't matter in that moment or at mm-hmm. that time so you know I and I suppose it's just kind of like who can cope with um you know their boundaries maybe being breached a little bit in this situation mm-hmm. or you know who, who if it's not you know, who's it going to affect the most and you know I suppose that that's it isn't it it's like it's like that who, who can get access to things or who you know who needs it more and it, it's not yeah, I mean, there is no formula for it, is it really? It is just about trying to live together. That reminds me of managing an event and trying to make it friendly to different disabilities. And I remember working with someone while we were preparing a pride event a couple of years ago in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. And they were like, if, if, if you see a description for the event and it says, you know, it, it's accessible for everyone or like, you know, it, then that's, that's not possible because someone's accommodation might be having a service dog. And then for someone else, they have trauma related to dogs or they're allergic to dogs. Like mm-hmm. someone's accommodation is someone's obstacle. And so I, th- I mm-hmm. agree with both of you very much that it's complex and it often just requires it's, it's, it's a long process of having conversations with people and trying to figure out where's a middle ground, where's something where we can all feel comfortable or at worst, like just a little uncomfortable and not like we're screaming on the inside. Like that really needs to be important. So lots of communication. That's what I'm hearing. Oh, speaking of communication, someone like breaches my boundary that I didn't even know I had, or I realized I need to set a boundary after an experience. Or I just realize I've never wanted to do this physical experience. I don't want to ever go to this kind of party. How do I set that boundary? How does one go about that? You mean like saying no? I, I, how do you mean? I, I mean, like for people who are have maybe never set boundaries before, they're uncomfortable. Like what, what are they supposed to do to actually make the boundary happen? And, and the bad news is it feels really uncomfortable to start setting boundaries. <laughs> well because it's like what is this new thing I'm doing and it makes you feel uncomfortable but I think it's it's something that kind of gets easier and like I suppose for me actually a a big thing um like initially in the first even like year was um um pausing like I would you know if someone was telling me something I'd be like I'll come fix it I'll come do it I'll do you know and and for me it was like listen to what the person's saying and usually by the end of what they were saying they would actually have you know come up with their own solution as well whereas I was walking myself into all of these things and overextending myself so I think pausing is such a and, and actually just saying can I get back to you on it like you know because I, I don't know I'm really impulsive you know and so it's like yeah I really want to do this thing but actually just you know kind of saying yeah you know actually and I think it's important to have those phrases like literally to say okay thanks Uh, you know can I let you know later like literally just having those phrases sometimes Mm -hmm. because they're new to us you know I'm not I'm not advocating for you know teaching autistic script or anything like that obviously but you know it's like we haven't used that language we it is literally like learning a new language that's what it was like for me as an adult it was like oh what do I say in these situations and then it just you know, it, it, it is like literally starting a, a new language and then it just becomes more natural. And then I think the more you do that, you realize how much of yourself you've given to other people and how mm-hmm. much, of, you know, and, and how much of like even self-care, like for me, I, you know, I was like, oh, you know, deep down, I mean, you know, it's not nice to admit these things, but it's like, oh, why don't I take care of myself? Why don't I, you know, put myself first? Why don't I spend time doing the things I love doing? 
and it's actually like underneath it is you know I just think there's so many layers to things and it's like well actually you know it's because I don't care about myself like literally there is like this kind of I don't feel like I'm worth taking care of you know I can say I haven't time or I can't organize it or whatever but actually what it is is that like and I mean we're we're motivated by our feelings so like you know I think if we can't do something we need to start looking at our feelings really and, and all those layers that are under um you know why we can't do things obviously there's other reasons too but you know for me I think it's it, like that relationship with our emotions are are something we need to explore more you know and it's left out of the conversation I think a lot of time for for us <laughs> as a, to, you know it's it's like because everything's so behavior based it's like oh they do this they do that it's like how are we feeling and what are the what what's the impact of those feelings you know and it's I suppose I, I um you know obviously started learning about autism or autistic people or whatever and then it was like oh trauma and it's like learning about trauma but it's like you know, I'm learning about what we're saying about trauma here and at the same time you know getting involved in meditation and that kind of stuff and I'm like but this is just the it's like they're just it's like we're, oh emotions get stuck in your body energy gets stuck that's like what they've been saying over here shamanic you know, <laughs> healing and all that kind of stuff for like thousands of years and then we have all these people over here going writing books about like how trauma it's like too many feelings and it gets stuck and I'm like but that's literally literally what they <laughs> we already know we already know this and there's like tons of ways we can deal with this and then it's like this new discovery we're making about PTSD and trauma I'm like but this is literally human history already written for us what are we doing it's so ridiculous but, you know but that doesn't count because it wasn't empirically researched and peer reviewed and also they shared that through oral history which also doesn't count because we have to write it down so of I'm being course. sarcastic for everyone. I know oh yeah <laughs> and like why would you research that when it's like just something that like oh we can actually all help each other with and, and learn about uh you know and uh, you know and how our body like physical movement how we're all like sitting at desks now all that stuff it's like of course we're stuck of course there's so much you know we're not mm. we're not working through things at all and we live mm. in a world where um apparently we're the ones who lack social skills but everybody's really disconnected like we're so disconnected mm. now from each other it's like you know it's, it's like literally the first time in history i think that we've been everyone is just like families disconnecting you know and, i mean that's such a big thing in, in you know disabled community where you know you see a lot of parents kind of like oh, you know I'm, I'm my child and they're probably living with me for the rest of my life and I'm like but oh, I'm a mom I, I, I if my child wants to live with me for the rest of her life that, like, that's kind of what I signed up to you know it like doesn't matter whether someone's disabled or not it's like is that not parenting and like literally just a few generations two generations ago families lived together it wasn't you know it was grandparents raising grandkids and everybody together anyway it wasn't like you suddenly hit 18 and have to leave the house. So like, I just think we're living, we're living in a really kind of an exciting time where we're kind of, you know, realizing <laughs> all the stuff we already know. Uh, but at the same time, that like a lot of people just don't, don't, you know, that aren't, it, it's a scary time when you look at kind of how disconnected people are. And I think if you look at like social skills and social interaction, um, you know, you see that people are being, are faking it, like literally faking it. I think, for me, I, I was listening to um, uh, Russell Brandt. I really I listened to some of his podcasts and he had, oh, what's her name? Uh, I can't think of her. Barrett. Uh, she's a psychologist. Uh, that's not her correct title. Uh, what, what's her name? I can't think. remember it. Do you know it? Does anyone know? Can we talk? Barrett, Fleming Barrett. So uh, I'll try and think of it later. But um, it's basically she was talking about facial expressions and how like nobody can really read facial expressions and there's so much more to it like you know how people get it wrong cultural aspects of it all that kind of stuff that mm -hmm. we're only right we're only right something like 30 percent of the time and I think when I heard that like it was kind of like the final piece of the puzzle for me and I was like autistics are just honest we're just honest that we can't read facial expressions and we're not just, just lying to each other it's not that we have a difficulty everybody does and we're just really honest about it we're like I don't know how you're feeling what's that face about whatever like, what's that face about? Yeah. like I think that I literally went oh my god like it is just like we're honest about the way we're interacting with people we thought that we are actually have these difficulties as such you know they're so they're very human difficulties that we're all having 
Um, Lisa Feldman Barrett, I think is, um, is her name. Um, I have some of her books, which I haven't, haven't got around to reading yet, but it's, it's about that. It's kind of like how we interact with each other and read emotions and yeah. So like people are just pretending. I was like, oh my God, they're just pretending to you. They're pretending how they don't want you to feel. And, and you know, that's, I think oh, the world we're living in. And um, I think we're just very real. And I, I actually do have a theory that I kind of, we're, you know, exploring that actually like how we communicate, how autistics are neurodivergent people communicate um, is how humans communicate. And the rest of it is, is, is kind of conditioned. Um, mm communication like you know um that, that that's kind of what what i see that like literally we're, we're the ones who are just being upfront about it and i think that's where a lot of kind of neuro, um neuronormative people kind of get stuck in loops of just a name conversation just you know oh the weather and you know whatever's in the news at the moment and bloody x factor or whatever other nonsense that people are watching like I think people get stuck in that because they don't that that's what they've been taught to do and that's how they've always been spoken about so when you turn up like what you and you were saying earlier about telling everybody your business and everyone going what what no we'll put a lid on that um when you find other autistic people or other neurodivergent people and we all talk exactly the same way it's so refreshing um because I just think I can't be the only person who's telling like the old lady at the bus stop and she asked me how I am and I'm like well here you go let me tell you <laughs> let me tell you what's going on <laughs> and um I find they like it most of the time I think I don't know but um I, I give it to them anyways so by just I think there's definitely a, a condition of and I don't know if that harks back to kind of um times where children were seen and not heard and therefore weren't really communicated with in any way. So, and it was all, oh yes, papa, and oh yes, oh I had a brilliant day at school, and all, and it's not really, it's all surface level kind of stuff. And we, I don't know that I've ever met an autistic person that was just a surface level person. Like I don't think we communicate in that way in any way, shape, or form. Um, and I don't think we um I don't think we do anything on a surface level like you know I think there's a re I, I'm not huge on the word but like I think there's a reason why special interests is a thing it's like a commonality between us all because it, it it's not you know we don't just like baking cakes like we know how to make all the cakes <laughs> and we have eight million jelly molds and this stuff and that stuff and everything else like it's not enough to just kind of dabble in stuff it's um, you know, you have to know the whole ins and outs of everything, which is why I think so many of us, when we realise we're autistic, have autism as a as a dedicated interest. Um, yeah. yeah. And then you try talking to other people about it and they just look at you like, they're still going on about this. Yes, yeah. It's important oh, yeah, we stuff for an yeah, hour. <laughs> Eight years <laughs> later. <laughs> they're still at it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, but I, I do, I think it's superficial. And I think it's kind of like, um, mm. for me, I hang around people when they're after a few drinks, you get to know the real person. It's like, the, 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 you know, the curtain comes down or the veil comes down, they then start connecting and you're like, so really, you know, who, who who's doing the pretending? Who's doing the masking? Mm. You know, it, it, it's really interesting. I really like talking about that kind of stuff. And I, I do think even though, even when I was masking, you know, or, protecting myself you know very deeply let's say that I had literally disconnected from who I was myself didn't know myself at all I still had those elements of me so you know what I mean that's how strong they are it's like you're still connecting that that need for you know um like I was still obviously autistic even though I was masking basically you know that kind of and wanting and just I really think it's it's about our um or, you know, even with special interests, whatever, it's like, but every human being only has specific interests. Nobody's interested in everything. Like mm. nobody, like nobody, you know? So it's like our level of intensity, because I mean, it's, it's, it's related to our, you know, sensory profiles, our sensitivity. Like if you're plugged into the world and you're literally noticing everything around you, then obviously your emotional responses to that and to everything is going to be like dialed up, 
instead of somebody who's maybe blocking out some of the stuff that's going on around them and you know performing and having an interest in whatever because it's the female thing to do the woman you know what I mean that like we were talking about earlier like playing that role or you know like I mean even the way I don't know I used to dress it's like totally not me like I literally have these two rows of shoes that were like heels <laughs> like heels that were like about 200 euro each and I have my words and I'm like I'm actually gonna take a picture and write a blog and then I'm going to like burn them or give them away to somebody yeah. because it's like it was like I'm, I'm talking about nine months pregnant wearing heels like literally kind of going I can do anything yeah like I yeah like literally, literally nearly wore them into the maternity ward it was mm-hmm. a bit of a joke you know because it was like but that's how that's how that's how much I was performing it was like I can do anything I can be nine months pregnant out to here and tottering around in heels like ridiculous stuff you know when I look back now I'm like how how was I doing that you know and why and yeah um but yeah see I overshared there now you didn't need to know about my heels and my wardrobe (laughs) no that was great that was great because like I loved it because you're like you can do it but should you and that's also important with boundaries and that's also important with gender, like with boundaries, it's like, okay, maybe you can say yes to everything, but at what cost? And should you really do this? And do you really want to do this? And then with clothes, I mean, like I was talking about being hyper-feminine, hyper-masculine to try and do gender, right? Hmm. Yeah, like heels, mini skirts, long hair, makeup, like you were, you were doing the gender mask as well. You're like, this is what a woman is supposed to do, even though I'm pregnant <laughs> and I'm about to go to the yeah. maternity ward. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. oh. Oh, uh, but two boundaries, back to boundaries. Let's say someone keeps on crossing your boundaries. Yeah. It's becoming a problem. What's someone supposed to do if you've tried to establish a boundary and, and it's still not being respected? Um, it depends on the situation, but like uh, we've had those situations and it's, sometimes it is just then that person isn't good to be in your life if possible. And that happens with families, like literally who just don't respect mm-hmm. boundaries. If people don't respect boundaries, then they're very, very difficult to be around. I don't mean someone who's well-meaning and, you know, kind of doesn't knock on your front door if they're bringing you your dinner and <laughs> stuff like that, you know. But I mean people who, like, intrude and, you know, create chaos and, and stuff like that. I, I just think if someone doesn't respect your boundaries, then, then that's where you really have to enforce your boundary and say, well, look, I'm here. If you want to, you know, kind of be in my life, this is how it has to be. Until then, you know, I'm, I'm going to take a break or something. I mean, like... It happens to a lot of us. It happens with with family members, and you know it's painful, and you know you wish it doesn't have to be like that. And a lot of the time, it's their trauma that they haven't dealt with mm-hmm. that's affecting all their stuff and you know, what's going on in their heads and, and and all of that. So it's you know it's sometimes it's it's so much more than we. It's it's like why is that person not, like if someone's not respecting your boundaries, there's a reason to that, mm-hmm. and you're not that reason. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? like recognizing that and going I can't fix this person like because I know we have I, I know I you know want to make everyone feel good and fix people and all that kind of stuff it's like sometimes you just can't and sometimes mm-hmm. it's not a good relationship to be in and you mm-hmm. just end it I think that's pretty that's kind of what I would think mm-hmm. I, I think um um you know I think about like if you know there's this kind of idea of you know family above everything else um culturally in the UK and I'm sure other places perhaps even more so actually and I think there's a really toxic toxic idea actually like I think it's all very well if you get on with your parents or the adults who raised you or whoever was at home but like I always think to myself would I part with this from someone who was part of my chosen family like if my husband was acting that way would I part with it no would I have a fr- would I keep on a, with a friendship if someone was treating me this way or not respecting me for you know various different reasons like that and I always try to take it out of family because it there's something about the family framework that is very very flawed and I don't mean from an individual perspective I mean like systemically like there's there's this idea of oh well blood is thicker than water and well you okay. should respect them because they're your parents and they raised you and they brought you into this world and you know I mean you didn't ask for any of that but like you know there's this kind of idea that um that you should that, that parents or whoever that parents or carers just kind of blindly get the respect of their children 
um, which I think is very, very worrying. So I always think, and I, I hopefully this is helpful to somebody else, but like, would I put up with this behavior from uh, my boss at work or like if I had a choice about it, my colleagues at work or um, someone I'm friends with or um, a significant other, like, would I put up with this behavior there? No, then why would I have that from my cousin, my brother, my whoever else? Like it doesn't, I don't think you sharing a last name or blood or anything like that is gives anyone an excuse to to mistreat people. No, I think that's a really important point. And it, it's the same here. It's like if you're Irish, like you know, you could be talking and but that but she's your mom. And you're like, it could be like this horrific story of abuse, and you're like, but would you say that to me if it was like a friend? It's like, and I think that's a really good way of doing it. Mm. Yeah, you're not obligated to be this is the thing we're not obligated to be in a relationship with anyone even people we're like related to mm -hmm. um, yeah because it can be toxic i mean it's as simple as that you know if you can't have a healthy relationship with someone what's the point anyway what's the point and i can't do fake can you do you know like where people can to do the thing where they're fake where they're like you know i don't want that person in my life but i'll still call to see them and do the fake thing no. I yeah i can't either i'm like it has to be real it has to be real um yeah um someone asked a question about um children in that situation that's a really tough question isn't it like what about children or young people who haven't the agency to remove people from their lives mm. that's a really good question I, I don't have an answer i don't think right now well you have to prioritize your safety if that person is feeding you or financing you and you are mm. truly unable to remove yourself from the situation you need mm. to find ways to cope which is terrible because you shouldn't have to deal with that behavior but if you're in that situation um and there's there's no safe out you know you can't talk to i mean ideally if it's possible if you could talk to an educator or a, a trusted parent or a trusted person who is in a more of an authority role than you mm. something could change so that is yeah. something to think about, but if not, or at least in the short term, you have to have mechanisms to try and regulate yourself, try and have space to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and that might mean not having the boundaries that you would ideally like for yourself if you had that power. Maybe yeah. Katie or Evelyn have more thoughts. Yeah, I feel like that's really massive in trans communities. Like we, I, I see that all the time. Um, like, you know, um, someone has, you know, come to the realization that you know um they're not the gender they were assigned at birth and they want to perhaps change their name or their pronoun or um the way they present themselves or whatever and it's just really just like at, uh, you know especially in like heavily religious families and stuff like that like no like this is the way i made you this is the way god made you like yeah it's just not not under my roof is is something that I hear a lot, which is which is awful, um, and unfortunately, like it doesn't happen under their roof, like until you can get yourself together to move out or find somewhere a safe space. Um, and I think that's definitely the same for for autistic people as well who aren't trans. Um, it's it's just yeah, I there's no easy answer to that really because if there was, there'd be a lot of a lot of us here wouldn't have. Um, dealt with probably the stuff that we've had to deal with I'm sure yeah you see that's the thing and it, I suppose it goes for so many other relationships just where someone has that power over you I mean you could just be a partner being the principal earner owning the house you being reliant on them and you yeah I mean it, it, it is that hope this is where outside advocacy comes in people who can advocate for you and this is mm. I suppose where we're leaving each other down as a community and as a as a society is that we we, we don't have that we don't like you know, I mean, for autistic people to get somebody who can advocate on their behalf, whether it's with professionals or, you know, for, you know, whatever, it, it just isn't something that there isn't enough um, support or services there in, the, in, in what, and that's really what a lot of us are, need. It's not, you know, I mean, people, to, you know, I mean, I think that's probably one of the, and even people who are able to advocate for themselves in certain situations maybe may not be in others. And um, yeah, that is probably, um, yeah, it's a really important question, isn't it? It's a really good question. And 
I, I think that that is it's just like sometimes stuff is out of your control you have to go outside of yourself yeah mm. it's hard when I, like, I, yeah sorry Soph um I think Chloe's gone on to say that this person who, who messaged said that um that is also a parent whose young person is being forced to have professionals in their life that are traumatizing that young person. And the parent also has little power in the situation because they are also autistic. The parent and home are safe. It's the local authority that are the problem, sadly. Yeah. So it's a, I and mean, this is the thing, it's a power, it's a power problem, isn't it? So the only way to solve that is you can get someone who's got more power to come in to, you know what I mean? That, 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 is kind of what 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 you're, what you're dealing with if someone isn't in that position of power isn't willing to treat you equally you know um and, and it's disempowering you that that's kind of yeah i mean that i think that is that is there's no really solution but it is a need for for you know for support and advocacy from the outside yeah, we're taught that professionals, local authorities, uh, often we're educated that they're supposed to protect us and keep us safe and they're supposed to respect us. Now, of course, in the US, uh, we've people have become familiar with the talk that Black parents will give their kids. So they might learn at school that a, a police person is safe, but the family really knows and educates mm -hmm. the kids that that's not the case. And so this is something that as autistic people and then with any other identity we throw on physical disability bipoc woman femme looking visibly trans old young throw in anything you know visibly a different religion and it just packs onto you and you're more likely to not be supported by these officials and i so wish that there was a oh you know in some of these systems there are ways where you can send a complaint in or talk to someone else and potentially get help uh, if you have the means, it's possible perhaps you can move to a different space, move to a country, but who has, <laughs> does everyone have the means to do that? No. So it's a really specific individualized problem. And I really wish that we could do something about it uh, in the short term. I'm sorry that we can't. I think we may have missed another question as well. Let me just have a little look. Oh no, I think it was just perhaps Katie in the comments was talking about um, their brain getting stuck on the script um, in a dependent way and then going into panic or meltdown sometimes if it goes awry in a serious enough situation. A no that turns into a yes is better received than a yes that turns into a no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll take that because I think you were saying about pausing for a moment and thinking about whether you you actually have like the capacity. Yeah. Um, to get involved um and I, I do that as well I have a um like I don't know anything without my diary so like I, I don't know what's happening this week without seeing my diary physically in front of me yeah. so if anyone if I'm ever in a situation and I it, it's taken me a long time to learn this instead of just going yeah I'll help with that or yeah that, don't worry I'll do that especially at work um I now say well, now I've got a child, so like <laughs> he's the best excuse in the whole world. But um, you know, I you know, I think, oh, have I got childcare for that? Or, you know, I need to check my diary or I need to check it with Jay, who's my husband. Like, um, whereas before I would have blindly just said, Yes, yeah, well, of course I'll do that. Of course I'll do that. And I think you get you also get to be I, I'm not in any way a yes man at all but like i think people at, at work will then think well they'll go along to it or they'll help with that or they all we always do this together so obviously they'll be there um and then you just get trapped in this constant cycle of pretty much doing other people's work and i'm just like i'm not really not really into that and then when you start saying well you know no i'm not going to turn up to that or like oh we've got this thing going on are you representing no like it's in an evening, I have a 10 month old at home. If I'm having an evening off from being a parent, like I'm going out, <laughs> like, I'm not doing something for work, you know? Um, so I, I think, yeah, the pause is definitely big, but if you can use, if you, if you find the pause difficult and you feel like you need to give yourself an excuse 
so you can give yourself time to process whether you actually want to do something um then yeah i would say like oh i've got to check my diary or um you know um jay and i have this system with each other where um whereby like we're fine if we use each other as an excuse for things yeah. um so like if you have a significant other or like significant others then like i think you could possibly get like something going along with that as well and just use your children as excuses as well like i'm into it <laughs> anything as an excuse anything yes yeah and sometimes you don't need excuse i um was reading something this morning about like how to protect your energy or like how to say no or have better boundaries mm -hmm. surprisingly uh i didn't realize it was the same topic as today um but one of the options was like, you don't need an excuse. Like, it feels like we have to validate why we can't give that time because otherwise, of course mm -hmm. we would do that. And we're so sorry that we can't, but sometimes you just get to say, no, like, I don't have the capacity mm -hmm. to do that, do that tonight mm -hmm. or this weekend. Mm -hmm. um, maybe next time, if that's what you really want to say, don't just say that to be nice. Um, mm -hmm. But you don't, you don't have to say no is a full sentence. I have heard that so yeah. many times and I love yeah. it. Just yeah. no, thank you. I appreciate you. Hope you can get the help you need. Yeah. yeah yeah like yeah or that sounds really interesting maybe next time or something like that like oh, I, I have a whole like page or two in the book about how to, different ways to say no it's like yes. <laughs> different ways you can say no uh, because for some of us it's, it's it is literally learning from scratch about how to say it let me but, see if know, i can find it because there I mean, was some really good stuff in there as well and i like the fact that you did um not um non-speaking or like non-verbal ways of saying no as well and also about how to say no to stuff i think it was like online as well i think you may have done um but yeah you had a lot of good you had a yeah i have no idea what what <laughs> where would that be i should know <laughs> you should know come on i should know as well. like here's uh but no because i mean it is important like i because it's not just simple as telling someone to say no. It's like it is oh, something that we're not used to doing uh, at all. Um, I think How dare you not have your book memorized? Oh, yeah, I know, that's it's terrible. Like, really, uh, it's like it's done now. So I just forgot about it, and on to the next thing. <laughs> that's just how I. Here we go. Here are a few examples from Eveline's book. No, oh, I, I can't, can't do that. Well. But here's what I can do instead, which I like um let me think about it i like that gives a bit of space i would prefer another option which i like and i'm not comfortable doing that which is absolutely fair enough and then I, I'm, I'm literally just reading stuff from your book i'm hoping that's okay that's what we find, <laughs> i found um, that as well so it's, yeah and then we and just have like yeah funny ways of saying no and, and you know just have a bit of fun with it yeah yeah because you said that at the end about um what what, what was the was it confuse what, what was it into oh ignore uh, confuse defeat that's you want to explain that a bit more yeah that that's um that's something i came up with my little girl because we were walking through the woods one day and she was talking about uh people calling each other names and uh she was like and i called them and i was like you're playing the wrong game it's not about who has the smartest name or who's you know quickest comeback that's kind of what i used to think i was like this is just someone looking for a reaction you know we kind of talked about it and um she um in this context that's what it was and uh yeah we just i was like so you have to try and ignore them and like it's really hard to do that when you're literal like when you words matter to you like how can you just ignore these words that have come into your head so you know that's it's a big ask to kind of say ignore them but i think like my mom used to say to me like oh ignore them so i would physically like walk past people you know like I think she meant it quite literally and I used to do it quite literally but like when I explain it to my kid I'm, I talk about like not let that means like not letting it into your heart and your head you know that it's it, it's it, it's their words um and then you know so the way to deal with that isn't kind of having the, the smart you know a really good comeback in that situation it, it's about like confusing that person giving them a response they don't expect you know like what did you have for dinner yesterday if someone's calling your name because it just throws them up if people are expecting a certain response because that's how the game goes and then you just like act, are you really nicely back 
um, they don't know what to do. So it's uh, then she came up with like a little ignore, confuse, defeat. Defeat she added in. So <laughs> we have ICD, ignore, confuse, defeat, um, as as our little thing. Um, but you know, it, it's like you know, ideally you'd like to have a world where you didn't have to teach your kids to play these games. But it's also good that they know these games exist because like. I wouldn't have I just you know didn't know what people were doing and I was playing the wrong game a lot of the time and um you know but um but even, even like you know talking about like having boundaries and saying no to people like that awful feeling of letting people down like you know again if you grow up as a people pleaser and then you're like oh that it's like an internal <clears throat> wrench you know like wrenching that is like I can't say no to this person. I can't cancel. Like, you know, how many times have we gone to work really sick? How many times have we done something for someone we didn't really want to do? You know, literally you're hanging tired, whatever. And you're just doing the thing because it actually is easier for you to do the thing and feel awful than to feel that bad about canceling. Like that's, you know, it's like that internal battle that goes on. Um, but like that stops the more you say no to people and the more you actually realize, oh, I can do this. And it gets easier. And actually people pick up on that. Like, you know, I was talking about like shamanic and all that kind of stuff a while ago, but like shamanism, it's it's like we give out those vibes and those people, people who, you know, they know that if I ask Katie to do this work, you're the easiest person in the office to ask or whatever in the situation. So they, they're not dealing with, you know, and it's like they, they, you know, I think people can sense it's the same as bullying. It's all that kind of stuff. It's like they can sense it. It's like, well, that person's going to say no, say yes. They always say yes. So they're my easiest person to go to first. Whereas if you start saying no, then they have to work a little bit harder on other people. And I think that was, I mean, I think looking at what other people are doing as well. I mean, like, look, because, you know, for me, that was a big thing as well. Like be, trying to be this perfect person for everybody. And then like looking around and going, but wait a minute. People are insulting each other right, left, and center. You know, these people are like doing these things. Why am I putting myself under this pressure? And so you get something wrong, you just go, I'm really sorry. I like I don't have, but that's easy because it's not that deep shame, which is like responding to all those moments of shame you've had like all your entire life. Like, you know, I suppose mm -hmm. if you, you know, I suppose it is really. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that's kind of what I said at the beginning. It's like, yeah, we have to work hard at putting in the boundaries and it does get easier. But I think at the same time, we also need to be working on our environment and we need to be working on, on trauma with somebody who is, you know, trauma-informed, neurodiversity-informed and someone who, you know, or, or someone who's, you know, trained in something that's been around for thousands of years. Um, <laughs> you know, something along those lines. But, you know, it's not like, yeah, like, I, yeah, I suppose it's, 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 it has to be a multifaceted approach, doesn't it? It's not like, you know, but I think like definitely having strategies and having little phrases. Um, uh, yeah, like in a, the reason we had a, a Bill Cullen, I don't know if he, he's, he's a big like entrepreneur here in Ireland. He would have owned Renault Ireland and stuff like that. And he came to talk to us in college. And I just remember him saying, and I read his books afterwards, but one of his things was like, say nothing till you hear more. It was just his phrase. It was like his advice on business. You know, he was like, you say nothing till you hear more and it just stuck in my head like it's still there you know sometimes if someone's talking and I feel like offering to help or, or whatever saying yes I just I hear the line in my head say nothing till you are you know till you hear more and you let that person talk and it was like the best piece of advice I got in probably my entire life you know <laughs> like, I'm just writing so it down <laughs> yeah but I mean I didn't know I was autistic I was when I was in my 20s you know what I mean it stuck with me and it just yeah I think those things it's like those little things that you can run in your head reminders or whatever write them down do what you need to do mm. you know and writing lists of pros and cons is something as you know sometimes you don't know or what's stopping you as well as one for me it's like um you know procrastinating about doing something and then like trying to actually figure out like what it is that's getting in my own I'm you know because we get in our own way sometimes um like and what it is and for me it is usually some sort of feeling self-doubt you know it's not one of those things um a lot of the time um but yeah I suppose that it, it's your self-awareness helps you with all of these things too doesn't it yeah. like you have that's the thing you have to work on that at the same time and I, th I don't know if this is personal to me but I I feel like <clears throat> some autistic people will at least um see this in themselves as well like I think when someone comes comes to me with a problem 
that I automatically think what what they are after and what they need is for me to have the answer, to have the fix, to have the knowledge, to have the resources to help them in whatever situation they're in. Um, and learning that that's not the case was a really big thing for me. And again, like I'm in my early 30s. I've only just really learned this in the last couple of years. And I'm still trying to get used to the fact that um, that that is the case. And I think in a lot of autistic spaces online, like support groups and stuff, people just say, I'm not looking for advice. I just want to rant. And then they'll tell you what. So like, I th- a, a lot of people don't disclaim what they're saying, but like, I think it's worth also to sit there and think, well, you know, do, do you just want comfort or are you looking for solutions and stuff like that? Because I think sometimes we can overstretch ourselves as well in situations that actually don't really, that people aren't actually asking for that anyways. Um, and I find I do that. I go right into like, and I think it, it it's, it's the mode that I'm in at work, I suppose. So like, that's the role that I go into. Okay. So like, you know what can you do who do I know that can help you with that particular situation and stuff like that and I I don't know if that's something that is shared quite a lot I don't know if that's something you do Eveline or Sof yeah I think it's very natural like we're natural problem solvers so I think it's like really natural for us to just try and find like the solutions will just come it's not like something that we have to do so it's and but I get what you're saying because for me as well I had to realize that like and actually also for me that sometimes mm. I'm I ha- and now I say it you know to my husband or whoever I'm talking to usually him <laughs> I'm like um I'm literally just talking this out loud I literally you're a sounding board I just need to process this and I just need you to nod <laughs> like I don't need any solution here um but kind of it, it, it I mean it's just wanting to help people, you know, it's not a bad thing, but it's just, yeah, if that person doesn't want that in that moment, it's not good, it's not right for them. So yeah, I think just being up straight about it, up front and, and, and kind of saying, what do you need from me right now? Or, you know, if you're in a relationship that you can tell that person, I don't need you, you know, I don't need action. I just, is it like comfort, like you were saying, comfort listening or, or action, like what do you need from me? Because, you know, we can get it wrong as human beings, like obviously, mm. we don't, you know, and we forget to ask and then I suppose that's what we give out about isn't it people giving us things we don't need and support you know they're not mm. supporting us when we do and I mm. suppose it's just but I, I think it is because we're just very natural problem solvers mm. and I've gotten used to I think um Chloe said about checking your spoons as well so like your energy levels yeah. and stuff yeah definitely um and I've gotten used to not that I was going around hugging everyone like a strange person but I've gotten used to asking people if they want hugs now like in in particular um you know so I work with quite a few neurodivergent people in the office as well and then they have neurodivergent kids so there's always a lot of stuff going on um for the people I I work with um uh, you know fighting against you know schools and healthcare plans and various other things um and I because we work in the same place I know that what they're asking for is not problem solving because <coughs> we share a lot of the same information the same resources so I I understand better that it's just I need to say this out loud to someone or I need to say this out loud to someone in a room where people will actually get what on earth I'm talking about um and then I'll say afterwards you know do you want a hug because I, I am not good. I understand that people get comfort from that, but I, it's very difficult for me to understand when that is. Um, so I'll ask it now. And then some people will say, you know, actually, this it's going to set me over the edge. Like, I'm not crying just yet, but if you hug me and you're too nice to me, it's going to set me over the edge, which, you know, a couple of years ago, I would have thought, like, how can you be too nice to somebody? Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think asking stuff is definitely, yeah. is definitely useful. Yeah, totally. I mean, sometimes it's like consensus. It's like I can feel the movement. It's like the person needs the hug, but I I would check or that they're moving back. Yeah, it's not like I don't. Um, but I think like it, it, this is for everything. I think we should always like it, it's personal space. So like we should always ask somebody if they want, mm. us, you know, and, and then I saw there's a comment there about like teaching, you know, teachers in school about autonomy and stuff like that. It's like, you know, we have this idea that like we teach kids about consent when they're like 13. 
in case they're having sex. And it's like, what did you do? No, <laughs> like, consent starts like when you're putting your hair, kids' hair in plaits and they don't want their hair in plaits or they don't want to do piano and you're dragging them to piano every week or they don't want to wear that thing right now, you know, and you're making them wear it. Like that's, that, that's why we end up, you know, being abused as, as teens or uh, whatever. Like that, it starts there. So like, I think we need to start like asking, like even things like holding hands. Cause I've, you know, I was a drama teacher for so long and you know, it was just like, okay, everyone get in a circle, hold hands. And I suppose when I, you know, found out he's autistic and kind of, you know, people are so, some people are touch sensitive and all that kind of stuff and triggered. And it's like, oh my God, I've never asked children, are they okay with holding hands with each other? You know, and then people, you know, you'd have some kids maybe doing this the odd time where they don't want to hold hands. And I'd be or like happy. barely touching. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and I was one of those teachers who thought the children were doing something personally to annoy me at that time, you know, with, why are they doing that? You know, why don't you just hold hands? You know, because obviously, you know, I'm a work in progress like everybody else. And, you mm. know, so I'm first with it. So, you know, then, you know, I really started or, you know, a game where you might be like, I'll just tap someone on the shoulder or whatever. It's like, actually, no, like we really need to be asking permission all the time. And that was one of the lovely things in, in the school. I the Sudbury school was like, they were showing me around the school afterwards. Um, it's a really small school. Like it's just been set up in the last year. Um, it's an old house and everything, but it, like, I just loved it. But you know, there were kids in the rooms and like, they didn't just walk in and go, show me. I'm just showing everything in the room. It was like, are you okay with me coming in to show? Is it okay if Evelyn comes in? I was like, oh my God, like, this is just, it was just like, yeah, we're coming into someone's space, you know? It's what we like, um, yeah, it, it's about, it really is about, or anytime we're kind of coming into someone's space to, to ask them or, you know, what they need. Um, but yeah, sorry, there was like, but, but. But also I do find, I, I don't know, do it like, I found that like work that, I don't know, a lot of my autistic friends, we hug a lot. I know some people hate it and, you know, that's totally fine and they don't like, but it's like, and like, uh, you know, that whole kind of, um, you know, idea with social skills training where like you have to like, I don't know, go on five dates with someone before they're your best friend, you know, that kind of thing. You must do this. And then you have your elder circle. And, and that's why I, like, they're not our boundaries. Like we can be connected to someone we just met. It's not about mm. like all these steps. And that's what they're teaching people. That, but like, I remember like, you know, like that meeting someone once and then like having a few messages and then maybe meeting to organize something. It's like big hugs, like we knew each other forever. And I'm just like, and, and that whole kind of like, I was thinking in another scenario, because we were meeting to do it, to organize a talk together. It's when I just like met, literally met once at a conference and then like had a few messages and we met up. It was this big hug. I was going, like in any other context, people would be like, that's really unprofessional. Like I wouldn't dream of hugging somebody that I usually was just kind of starting to work with, you know, but it's like in autistic spaces, it's it's really quite, it's it's just different, isn't it? We're not, um, I suppose it's just about being, and then obviously there's other ways of showing that as well, isn't there? I'm kind of just rambling on now, so I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> no, but it's fine. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's differences as well, isn't it? And um, I find that with, like, it's something I've started doing in the last couple of years um, at work to do with young people's stuff as well. Like, not just them as their own kind of individual people, but also their stuff as well, like are you okay? So someone was having a, a, um, a bit of trouble the other day. We went to Laser Quest and he got quite overwhelmed when we came out. Um, and he listens to a podcast to calm down. That's what he does. But he could not find his iPod. So I said, are you okay if I go into your bag so I can look for your iPod? Yeah, no, that's fine. Like, even though he was distressed and I had a feeling I knew what pocket he was in. He had a bag with like a million pockets in it you know you've still gotta ask like um because it's not my stuff to just I can't just go and ransack your stuff but then I I remember back in school where you know um kids stuff was just student stuff was always just like well I'm the adult and you know yeah. if anything had ever gone missing or anything like that they were just like checking everyone's bags and I'm like yeah. this is like police state stuff like what are yeah. you doing like this is actually our stuff and I and I don't know when those boundaries I don't know if it's like an um you turn 18 and therefore people don't do that anymore or like I don't know what the expectation is and I don't understand that that children are held to such higher standards than adults like they can't make mistakes and they can't do this and they can't have these emotions and they can't do these behaviors and they're literally learning how to be a human being like yeah. I know we all are but like 
I know a lot more now than I did when I was 10. So like, cut me a break. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, why are you expecting so much stuff from me? Like, what are you talking about? Like, and I'm just hitting puberty. Like, leave me alone. Like, yeah, I don't understand why people put so much pressure on children. It, like, it, yeah. like they've not had enough of that when they were kids. Like, at some point, we need to stop this cycle of like ridiculous ideas on what children should be and how compliant they should be and how they should dress and talk and behave. Like, I just think it's, yeah, I just think well, it's I mean, nonsense. But you say that to other people and they think you're some kind of hippie idealist, and I'm just like, no, I just, I just want my son to be happy. <laughs> I just, I just want him to be able to regulate his behavior, that like regulate his emotions as much as he can, and understand himself and love himself and be confident enough that when he goes out into the world that is pretty shit, in a lot of circumstances, that he's, he loves himself well enough to be able to kind of combat that stuff. And when you talk to other parents in other spaces and stuff. And I, I don't want to sound judgmental because people are going through what they go through and people parent and, fa- and have different families and stuff like that. And that's fine. Um, it, it's just, it's just strange when you go to some groups and yeah, it's very, um, is it to- totalitarian? Is that what I'm trying yeah, to think yeah. of? Or authoritarian parenting. And I'm just like, they're three, like, just calm down. It's okay. Like, because they think that their child's like showing them up well they're three mate like nobody cares like it's fine it's okay or like swearing at them in the middle of a shop or something and I'm just like why are you talking to your child like this like why do you hate your own spawn so much like it's just it's really it's really really sad so I can't remember what point I was making but I just think we expect too much from from kids and young people really yeah we really really do like in in society I think that's a problem and I think on individual basis like that's a problem and then we wonder why you know we have young adults who can't emotionally regulate who don't know themselves very well who um, are vulnerable to all sorts of different horrible things because they haven't been told like you said you were a certain age when you thought when you got told you can say no yeah you know and someone actually told you that like you can say no to these things, you know that, right? Like, you know, and what, and what does that mean for people who have other intersectionalities that make them even more vulnerable to things? Like, it's just, it's just scary. It's really, really scary. Yeah. Sorry, that's all like doom and gloom. Sorry. <laughs> no, but it's so true. I think it's important to talk about these things because I would have, I mean, yeah, I mean, I see my role as a parent just to keep my child safe, like literally guide her where it needs to be. I don't have a, and that's what I don't understand when people talk about having, plans for their children and then they're like disappointed when their child doesn't do the thing but I'm like I don't have I, that just doesn't exist it's like that's for her to decide yeah what's just, your plan and I'll go yeah. with you like that's and, I'm and facilitating have, here yeah 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 that's <laughs> it it's just a facilitator just keep someone safe and then um yeah I don't know like we have this thing that like we tell children something and we expect just because we told them that they should do it I'm like I know I shouldn't drink more than two glasses of wine. <laughs> you know, like, do I do what I'm supposed to? You know, it's like, we, we all know the stuff. We don't always do them because there's like a whole, you know, myriad of reasons why human beings do the things we do. And yeah, I, I think, I mean, you did mention earlier about it going back to kind of like children not being, um, uh, not being, being, you know, seen and not heard. I think it goes back further. Like, I think we're talking about, you know, thousands of years of, um you know literally you know um I don't really want to get into a religious debate or anything but you know it it, it is it's kind of like what you know children that fear I mean we talk about behaviorism as, as if it's something new um but that's been used for thousands of years I mean if you don't if you do this and you're a sinner you won't go to heaven you know all the, the, that that narrative that's punishment and reward it's literally you know what I mean so it's not new it's not like hasn't been something that's discovered and we're just using now it's like it has been so we're all kind of have been conditioned over thousands of years uh, you know and, and that's how I suppose we have the world we're living in right now um and yeah I mean that whole yeah I mean I think it probably got I don't know yeah I actually want to stop there because I think think I think what so yeah I'm 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 gonna skirt away from religion but I just want to say one more thing because I'm I'm likely to say something that's gonna get me in trouble um like I just I also find it interesting that um that some religious people 
use a deity as the scapegoat like you know um i can't think of for instance because i wasn't brought up religiously but you know it you know that you know premarital sex let's say premarital sex like you have to be um you know pure for your husband or whatever and obviously you're a girl so you will marry a man and you will have children yeah. and you know um and yeah but why because god says so yeah like that's just an extension of because i say so yeah yeah <laughs> isn't it yeah. and not under my roof like there's just an extension of that like but instead of it being my fault as a parent or carer like oh uh, well you know he's not going to be very pleased about that and i just i i yes i find that problematic but i i probably shouldn't talk about that too much yeah. um because obviously people are entitled to okay. whatever belief system you have so um, oh, yeah. I, I just find it interesting that power dynamic is interesting um, yeah I find it really interesting and I, I mean I do I mean I think people are entitled to believe what they want but I think we also need to look at things for what they are too and how how you know th that whole punishment reward thing has been used you know and and throughout you know in different religions and in different mm. ways and you know capitalism creeps in which they were selling it was like selling um you know, you could, if you paid us money, we'd make sure you'd get into heaven. That was a thing like hundreds of years ago. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So there's, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, led us to where we are today, I, I, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and I just think that, uh, yeah, I think we all need to do to do better. But like, um, yeah, I just, it, it does blow my mind about children because it's like, but we were all children. Like that's something we all have in common. <laughs> like, we like, all did you forget this? childhood. Yeah. Like we know what it's like. And I, it just blows my mind that we're like we knew what what it felt like. We know what when you know what it was like to do things we didn't want to do and all that kind of stuff. And it's like I don't know. It it, it blows. It does blow my mind. But I just think um, the idea of just having a, a respectful relationship with a child rather than having to coerce them and manipulate them is just mm -hmm. alien to so many people. Like they're humans, right? Like yeah, they're just small adults. Yeah, they they just can't go to war or get married or pay taxes. Like, thank goodness. That's that's that's, that's, that's like pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that probably wasn't a very good example, but like, all that happens when you turn eighteen is yeah, you get some more rights. Basically. But yeah, yeah, I mean, children don't have representatives. Like, where's their representative in government? Where's their representative? Like, children have no mm. point. Mm. No. Like, I know you know, there's lots of marginalized people, obviously, in our communities and all that, but. Like children have none, zero. They're mm. not actually asked how any of the stuff they're going through impacts them or what waves. Mm. It's just not, it just doesn't happen. You know? I do find it interesting. Yeah, like kids will protest, young people will protest and they will have strong justified opinions about climate change, for example, or in where I was born, Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm in North Carolina now, but uh, there's a, there's a teacher's strike, an educator's strike. And often people who are trying to break up boards or if not break up boards, break up like the union will be like, ah, the, you're, you're being cruel to the kids because they, they just want to go to school and you're stopping school so you can strike for rights or whatever. And then kids are protesting and they're, they're um, occupying spaces and saying, no, we want our educators to be paid. And then that's undermined or the, Oh, I have so many feelings. The don't say gay bill in Florida, like young people are protesting that. And it's, yeah, it sounds like in order for a lot of our issues with boundaries to change, especially if you're a young person, we need to change how we view young people in the world and mm. really gave them, give them the agency that they deserve and that they rightfully need to have. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And because we have this idea that they don't know anything and that like we're here to teach them. But I have learned so much from children. Like, mm. it's not a one way thing. Like anything, you know, that double A, but it's like, it's literally, it's a two, we, we learn from them. And but and I think people just dismiss what children have to offer. Like children have, you know, you know, cause this happens a lot when people are going, what, what will I do in my class? Or, you know, those kind of things we talked about where one person's, um, you know, need is kind of maybe triggering someone else, you know, what do we do? I'm like, ask the kids, like talk to the kids. You've got like these amazing little people in front of you who like are gonna come up with like 10 solutions at least. Why are we not, you ask them, it's like we have, it's like we have to tell them Every, you know what I mean mm. what to do and, and solve everything for them but like oh kids have been you know they're able to solve their own things you know 
and um, we just have to give them the space i think to do that yeah mm -hmm. um, i just realized we've been talking for two hours it's like yeah maybe we should ask our final question <laughs> so, okay okay like, has it been that long yeah. yeah what time did we start seven yeah i don't know yeah yeah, it's 505 yeah. over here. I don't cool. time isn't real over here. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm, I'm like, I'm starting to get a headache and I'm like getting hungry. I'm like, it's busy. <laughs> oh yeah, let's wrap okay. this up. That's fine. That's fine. Don't get don't get between the Irish woman and her dinner, please. <laughs> don't do it. It's not worth it. Right. Okay. Um, so uh soft, do you want to do our final question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I have a cube right now I've been stimming with for a lot of this time. What is your current favorite stim? Yeah. Um, it, yeah, Katie. my favorite stim is, see, I, I do, I have, like I do this all the time, which is why I'm here like putting this on every few minutes. It's just what I do all the time. Um, and then my my rings um, is, is just kind of, these are old ones, like I've had them for ages. Uh, and sometimes I don't notice until I'm, cause I, I, uh, I grew out of my rings. <laughs> During COVID, <laughs> it's just <laughs> mysteriously they shrunk. Mysteriously they shrunk, uh, you know, along with a lot of other stuff I own. But um, so I had to get them resized, or I just took them off, and um, uh, with great pain, with a piece of twine uh, or a string. But um, I had to get them resized, and I just left them there for ages before I brought them into the studios. And you know, I was there kind of going, "Oh, what am I doing now that I'm not doing this?" And obviously, because I'm on Zoom doing a lot of stuff, you know, I, I started noticing that I'm, I was doing this during during webinars and, and stuff like that but um and that's why I love actually do, doing this because it's like when I'm talking I can illustrate it's like I do this a lot when I'm like it's like literally trying to pick out the word in my brain like if I'm like mm -hmm. uh yeah and you can see it it's like literally going through my filing cabinet my little file of facts whatever if anyone remembers well no what are the spinny things anyways that's kind of what I see in my head Rolodex. your Rolodex that's it so it's like literally trying to pick through the Rolodex of words uh yeah and you can I mean, you can see them it's really cool and they're some really good examples so yeah I think they're, they're I, I, yeah I kind of just have done these for so long it's like that's just what I do but um yeah um um uh Katie do you have one right now um it's not necessarily my favorite but like <clears throat> I have one of these. It's a, uh, it's called a fat, fat brain toy. There's probably something else it's supposed to be called, but you know those like soft popper ones. I think, um, I think Chloe had one last week where they were the soft ones that you pop. I don't yes. really like those because for me, yeah, it has to click. The sound, it's the sound. Yeah, they're better. The sound I need like, and there's a resistance to this that I really yeah. enjoy. Oh whereas, no. Whereas for me, like the little poppy one doesn't make a noise and there's not enough resistance to it. And they're like really floppy and I'm yeah. not into it. So this was actually given to me by one of my parents at work. So um yeah. which I'm loving. But I also have a let me get my stim bowl. I also have you get key ring versions of it as well. Yes. So like sometimes I have that with me but it's also very annoying because I'd love to take this to uni but because it makes noise like I have to think of something that is similar to this and gives me the same input but doesn't make any noise so yeah. Yeah. but they are one of my favorite ones the noise is part of it though isn't it mm. my, my, my kid has literally like a tub we just bought a tub today and it's just full of uh, one of the uh, fidgets is what you call them yeah but we have all of them and the one, do you know the cordy ones that you pull? I hate the sound from those though. Do you know the tubey? Uh-huh. Oh, oh, don't. <laughs> no, I won't, I won't. I really want to, but I'm not going it's to. Like, it's been nasty, I just want to do it. Anyway. The first time she got one, she did it in the car and I was like, oh, the sound is just so, yeah. It's all oh, horrible sound off them. But yeah, we've, we've got a ton of them. Yeah, I don't know. I never, because I did try and experiment a bit with stimming. Like obviously I was meeting other autistics and everyone was talking about stimming and I was like, I don't stim. I don't stim at all. Like I, you know, I thought that for a while, and then I realized what stimming was, and I was like, obviously, every human being stims, so what I do. Um, but uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't found. I just kind of do. I don't know. I haven't found kind of any affiliation with, 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 or had any affiliation with, with stim toys. You know, I've tried them out. I've had some cool ones, but yeah, I don't know. I just. Hey, you've yeah. got your rings. You know, you have I've things that might not count as oh, my ear. You know, <laughs> I'm like good. They might not. <laughs> it works. Whatever works, works. 
Um, <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. I have a squishmallow That's and cool. it's very big. It's a very, like I'm five feet. So it's nice. Like it covers my whole torso and I can just snuggle it. So this is something I like. Yeah. Uh, yeah and I relate to you, Katie, also, because like I would be doing this in meetings all the time if I could, but I know it would drive people off the yeah. wall. The, uh, the clicking pen is only annoying if you're the person not clicking the pen. Like, yeah. yeah. Oh, Sai so had a final, final question too. Sai <laughs> so always likes to add questions that are good. And they're asked, uh, the, ask, the question is uh, Guinness or Bailey's? Oh, Bailey's. <laughs> Katie, okay, do you, you agree? Yeah, Bailey's. I don't like Guinness. It's just, it doesn't taste nice. It doesn't feel nice. It's just, it looks gross. Like, like mm. no. Whereas Bailey's is like, hmm, Christmas. Like, oh, that's what that. Bailey's is for me. I don't drink Bailey's very often, but like, I always associate with that with Christmas because I always have a couple of glasses at Christmas. So I like a bit of Bailey's. Yeah. Mm. Um, try it in a hot chocolate. Try it in a hot chocolate. It's like heaven. <laughs> Okay. Little, yeah and I think you can get like a, a mint version mint version of Bailey's yeah. can you imagine that in a hot chocolate mm. yeah do you even do you even know what drinks we're talking about so I, I know do the in the States. I do but I don't drink so like I'm not very fun this is like when I presented and Sai asked the question about um um mayonnaise or the other thing salad, salad cream. cream you all know the other thing I don't know <laughs> But I'm also like neither. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, neither. You got, you're going to catch me with a question someday where I have an answer. <laughs> Nickelback. You had Nickelback last week. Oh, yeah. You're right. Or, you're right. No, yeah. I did have that. Would you bungee into a volcano or listen to Nickelback? Yes. Yeah. You had Nickelback. That's true. That's fine. That wasn't much of a choice to me, but I understand it was much of a choice to other people. Oh, <laughs> and Katie, do you know what uh, any info about next week's live? Or maybe Sire or Dr. Chloe wants to share some more info. Oh, I don't actually know. <gasps> Exciting. Exciting. Maybe it will be a surprise. Maybe it will be a surprise. It will be a surprise to me because I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, but yes, shall we just um, finish today on Evelyn? Where can we get your books? Yeah, thank you for asking. So I'm so bad at telling people oh, this it stuff. <laughs> like, so it's uh, standing up for myself. And I have the other books, obviously, on my So it's uh, awesometraining.com or confidentkids.ie. And if anyone's interested in the program we run for kids, that's confidentkids.ie. So all the kids stuff is on Confident Kids. And then our books and all the adult training stuff is on awesometraining.com. And, and Confident Kids is written with a K. Oh, I know. I complicate everything. Confident yeah. with a K, kids with a Z. And then awesome is <laughs> A-U-S-O-M-E. Why did I pick things that I have to constantly spell? I don't know. <laughs> Just like to, so <laughs> like to so have a challenge oh Maybe. yeah and next week's session i got the info <laughs> yes turns out we just had to scroll up in our chat uh oh. <laughs> important autistic topics according to the autistic not weird survey where they um surveyed yeah. over eleven thousand two hundred twelve people and chris is going to educate our academy oh, so come hey. enjoy that i'm really excited about that yeah. survey That'd be really, really interesting. Well, thank you for um, joining us, Evelyn. We've had a very good conversation that's gone on quite a while. <laughs> and um, I don't suppose we get a outro. We won't see the outro music, will we? We'll just have to say goodbye and then hope that, and then just dance until Simon tells us to stop dancing, which will be for another two hours. No outro. Okay. Dun, 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 dun.